Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Benedikt Spies, and I'm the chair of the Department of Prosthetic Dentistry in Freiburg, Germany. I'll talk about survival and technical complications of zirconia oral implants. At the beginning, I raised the question whether do ceramic implants matter, and now regarding technical complications, on the first hand, we will talk about the implant level. Do you need to have concerns regarding the implant stability? Then we will talk about potential technical complication during handling of ceramic implants. And finally, we will switch to the prosthodontic level and talk about potential technical complications and survival rates of these supported restorations. And finally, we'll come to a conclusion. So the first question was, do ceramic implants matter at all? And according to the results of the EAO Delphi study, the big majority of the participating experts were of the opinion that in the next 10 years we will deal with both ceramic and titanium implants. As you might know, the zirconia material is prone to both stress-induced, local, but also environmentally induced phase transformation. And it's not yet clear maybe whether this is an advantage or a disadvantage, or is this only theory? And as you can see on this SEM images, this really occurs. Because on the left hand side, you can see an as delivered implant with only a few transformed grains in the surface layer. And on the right hand side, after aging and fatigue loading of the implant, this layer increased. However, you can see when you have a look at those um, fracture load values here and here, that this is liable in even increasing the stability of an implant. In our department, we evaluated some one and two piece implants. To have a good start, let's focus in the very first beginning on two one piece implants. The left hand one is made from alumina toughened zirconia, whereas the right hand one is made from YTZP. And as you can see here, you'll see two box plots, and the white one on the left hand sides are always the as delivered implants, and the grayish one on the right hand side represents the aged and loaded um, samples. Aging does mean 60 days in water set at 85 degrees, and loading does mean dynamic loading, chewing simulation for 10 million loading cycles. When comparing these two implant systems, both standard diameter, both subtractively manufactured, you can clearly see that sometimes loading and aging results in increase and sometimes in decreased fracture load. However, what is clinically relevant? That area is the area where volunteers in clinical evaluations equipped with strain gauge abutments on their implants, this were the forces recorded during mastication. This here were the forces uh, recorded up to clenching, and when adding an additional 100% safety buffer, you can still see that the range of those two implants is far away from the clinical danger zone. So from our point of view, one might recommend these systems for clinical application from a mechanical point of view. Let's pick one of those two-piece implants. There is an implant that consists of the abutment and the screw out of zirconia, and the abutment screw itself is made from a carbon fiber reinforced screw. Because the design is very similar to a well-known uh, titanium implant, we compared this implant system to a titanium and a titanium zirconium alloy implant, and we embedded the samples according to ISO 14801. As you can hear, see here in this slide, there was neither a big difference within the implants prior and after loading, so as delivered compared to loaded in age, and nor a big difference in between the systems. So the zirconia implant system was quite very stable, and bringing this data back to our overview, you can see that this system was even more stable than some one-piece systems and might be clinically recommendable from a stability point of view and is far away from the fracture zone. Another two-piece implant consists of three instead of two different materials. It consists of YTZP injection molded for the implant itself and a pack abutment um, mounted with the titanium abutment screw. In the following, you will see two videos, and I would like you to focus on this interface in between the abutment and the implant. Of the as-delivered implants during fracture, you can see there is no displacement in this area prior to fracture. 
However, when focusing on the loaded and aged implants, you can clearly see a displacement in this area, thereby increasing the leverage. And when we now have a look at the load displacement curve of these implants, this is the load displacement, displacement curve of the as delivered implants, and this is the load displacement curve of the um, loaded and aged implants. You can clearly see that a reduced load was liable in increasing displacement. This is not due to the zirconia of the implant, but due to the pack of the abutment. Therefore, PEC might not be the best solution as an abutment material. And as you can see here, there was one outlier that fractured during dynamic loading, which is in the middle of the danger zone, and that might result in clinical failure. Moreover, we tested several other systems, and you can see there are some systems that are entering the danger zone. This, for example, is one system that uh, used bonding for the connection of the titanium uh, the zirconia implant and the abutment. And as I mentioned to you before, our finding for that one system that um, failed during dynamic loading resulted indeed in one failure in a clinical patient. So this was, from our point of view, maybe predictable after doing clinical relevant preclinical um, research. And why are two piece zirconia implants far more complicated than two-piece titanium implants, that's quite easy because they are a multi-material complex compared to titanium implants where the fixture, the abutment, and the abutment screw consist of titanium, which is a highly predictable system. If you're interested in more information on the question, is a zirconia implant safe when it's available in the market? Or if you're interested in more information about preclinical studies regarding the stability of zirconia implants, please feel free to open this open access uh, papers published by our group this and last year. So going forward to the handling of that, such implants, as you can see here, it's not that easy to position a one-piece implant. In that case, it was quite easy because it was very easy to place the cementation line at the gingival margin. However, even if the um, bony crest is very scalloped, you sometimes have to find a compromise, and it's not that easy to position the transgingival part and the cementation line, and to likewise have all the screw threads covered by native bone. So therefore, this might be challenging. And it's sure that a two-piece system is always far more flexible. For example, you can add a scan post for digitization during surgery. You can do your conventional index during surgery. Or for example, you can finally deliver a screw retained provisional or final restoration. However, according to our literature review three years ago, data on two-piece systems in the literature is still very rare. It's important to note that this was three years ago, and for example, this year, the group around Michael Paya, the host of this session, published 80-month data for two-piece zirconia implants, which is a quite interesting study. Now you might raise two questions, and the one is, how can I predictably install one-piece implants without the, the trouble I mentioned before, and how can I simplify my clinical procedures afterwards? This is one clinical case. It's an upper maxilla with a hopeless upper right canine, and the patient asked for a fixed reconstruction using ceramic implants. And we made our mind how to predictably install these implants without a guided solution provided by the manufacturer. And in this case, we made our classical procedure. We um, matched the intraoral scanning with the, with the CBCT data. Our dental technician prepared a an, an mock-up and, and, and by means of backward planning. Then we were in the, in the situation that we could ideally position all those implants and could look that the cementation line is very um, satisfying positioned. And finally, out of this situation, the manufacturer of this guided solution was able to provide us with a splint that guided the handpiece. And he printed this splint so that we were now able to use this during surgery. The special thing about this guided this system is that it guides the handpiece rather than the drill. And you can see in those images how it works. And I'll now provide you with a short clinical video. You can now see here incision and flap preparation. And you can clearly see how the, the guide is drilling the handpiece instead of the drill. And it also helps you to install the implants um, like you did in the virtual planning. 
thereby allowing you for very parallel insertion of those implants. However, this is the situation 14 days after surgery and you might wonder whether it could be possible to digitize those implants without retraction of the gingival cord in order to, for example, create a gingival profile like this using a provisional that perfectly fits on that implants. We made our mind and the conventional procedure would be to digitize the implant using retraction cord, but this, however, results mostly in a very, very uh, compromised data due to the reflections of the zirconia. But however, we know the geometry of the abutment, so maybe we don't need retraction cords and can reconstruct this abutment by the known geometry. Maybe this is even possible in deep inserted implants, or maybe this is even possible in um, little or more uh, grinded implants because some of the original structure of the abutment is left. So this were our groups. As a control, we used prepared teeth. We used two teeth titanium implants mounted with a scan body. We used three scanners, two intraoral scanners and a laboratory scanner for this uh, study. And finally, we, we evaluated the circumferential and the marginal fit. This is the outcome of the marginal fit evaluation. You can see here our control groups. And in comparison to the control groups, our reconstruction with the well-known geometry was very precise and they were all in the range of clinical acceptance. Regarding the circumferential deviation, it was comparable, so both scanners were comparable for the control groups. There was a slight deviation for the reconstruction, however, we found this deviation to be in the range of clinical acceptance. So with reconstructing the abutment after digitization in the mouth, this procedure should work out. So we digitized the implants of the patient, we replaced them with the known geometry of the abutments in the dental lab, so our dental technician was able to create a monolithic reconstruction for this patient, as you can see here on the video. Finally, the question is, how do on the reconstruction level, reconstructions perform on ceramic implants? And we performed four studies for this purpose. The first one evaluated um, zirconia copings that were very thin and veneered with a very thick veneering material by hand layering. The second study evaluated better frameworks evenly supporting the veneering ceramic. In a third study, we evaluated monolithic crowns. And in a fourth study, because this material is not available for bridges supported by implants, we went for um, overpressing instead of hand layering. So let's have a look at the results. So the very thin copings and the very um, inhomogeneously distributed uh, veneering ceramic resulted in compromised survival and even more compromised chipping rates. When improving the design of the framework and using a more fracture resistant uh, veneering ceramic still needed for hand layering, survival improved, but there was still a big issue with chippings, even if they were now minor in in, in the area of chipping. Finally, the monolithic reconstructions showed nearly no chipping problems. We only had 5% and a high survival rate, but still overpressing the bridges resulted in good survival rates, but a very high incidence of chippings, like you can see here. So finally, we were able to increase the survival rates for all groups, but only monolithic reconstructions were able in reducing those chipping frequencies. Is this comparable to our findings for titanium implants? I think it is because, like you can see here for crowns, they, the chipping rate is double as high for veneered reconstructions compared to monolithic ones, and we have a rather high chipping rate after five years for bridges that are veneered. But however, they're a little bit reduced compared to our rates, and it seems like there is a tendency towards more chipping at um, reconstruction supported by ceramic implants, but it's not reaching statistical significance. So finally, we provided the patient with monolithic reconstructions made from zirconia. There is not that much data available for this type of material to date. And we made our mind how to cement this reconstruction because we all know cement remnants are liable inducing peri-implant inflammation. So we took this investigation performed by a group in Basel and they compared the excess cement of conventionally cemented crowns with 
ones that were pre-cemented to laboratory abutments extraorally prior to cementation and a venting technique using a palatally located venting hole. And you can clearly see that this venting technique is very capable in reducing the excess cement. So finally we use this technique for cementation and here you can see the final result of the case I presented to you. And finally, this is the radiograph after prosthesis insertion. Now we're coming to the conclusions. First of all, we might conclude that 1-piece implants, at least if they have a standard diameter, should be stable enough for clinical evaluation. You should be carefully selecting your 2-piece system, and I would rather recommend to screen the literature before using a two-piece system in daily clinical routine in your private practice because some systems might not be that stable. The digital workflow helps us to facilitate especially the use of one-piece implants. And finally, one can say that crowns and bridges supported by ceramic implants have high survival rates, but there is a big issue with chippings and you should go for monolithic reconstructions whenever possible. So thank you a lot for your audience and have a nice evening. Goodbye.